Who Birthed the Indus Valley Civilization? Hi, my name is Brian Osborne, a speaker and writer with Answers in Genesis. I'm here with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, a researcher, scientist, and speaker also with Answers in Genesis. And we're so glad you're here with us today to talk about this very intriguing subject coming from his book called Traced. So looking at basically the human genome, tracing it back in time through the Y chromosome, showing really an amazing connection to all of humanity, going back to one man and one woman ultimately, imagine that, right? And how history and science confirms that. And so we're going to dive into this subject a bit more deeply today. So put on the hard hats, get ready for some good critical thinking, but some good biblical thinking as well. And Dr. Nathaniel is going to, Dr. Nathaniel Jeans is going to lead us through this journey uh, to really making these connections to the Indus Valley human genome, the Bible. It's going to be awesome. Looking forward to it. Bear in mind, there are many previous episodes to help uh, kind of lay a foundation for this one as well. And there are more to come later on. So be sure you're bookmarked and getting notifications to get more of these coming down later on uh, down the road. But this one's going to be excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, take it away, please, sir. Thank you, Brian. And again, if you're joining us in real time, instead of binge watching, I'm going to give you some context here real briefly. We do want to focus on the history of South Asia here. I'll tell you why and where we've come from, where we're going here in a moment. This is again, part eight of a longer series. The numbering scheme I'm using is according to the YouTube playlist, which I'll tell you how you can find that here in a moment. And as Brian alluded to, the, the really big picture focus of what we're doing, both this book, which this series is intended to highlight and, and give you a preview of, uh, so both the book and the videos are focusing on as, it's, uh, as the primary tool to uncover human history, a DNA-based, generation by generation, family tree for global humanity, based on the Y chromosome, the male inherited DNA from men around the globe. And if you wanna find previous episodes or keep track of what's still coming down the pike, you can go to the Answers in Genesis YouTube page, find the playlist tab and Traced DNA's Big Surprise will be one of these playlists. So now we're up to video eight. If you were, again, with us in real time and, and watched our previous episode dealing with history of the Middle East, you know, that was after a gap of some time. And we, we've been trying to time these around when the book's actually in stock. We sold out of the first printing very quickly, which I was pleased. And second printing should already be here. I also want to say we've had an ebook that's been available the entire time for freely available download. There's also been some updates to the original release where I think it's the Kindle version has hot links where you can go back and forth between the color plates. There's 235 of them. They're a central element of telling the story of humanity, the history of humanity. In the first mini section of this longer series, we covered about three of the seven civilizations that my book focuses on. This, this latter now mini series, we're focusing on the, on the last four groups that I didn't cover originally. The overall focus of the book, again, is primarily to look at human history. What is the history of peoples, not of politics or of cultures, but the peoples themselves? Who did they come from? What happened to them after their civilization collapsed or was conquered? We looked at the Middle East last time. We're gonna look at the history of South Asia, India today. And in future episodes, after we, we finish these, the history element, we're gonna step back and say for about five episodes, how do we know the conclusions and traced are true? What, where does this come from? What's the data behind it? And there's a there's a ten year story here, really, that I'm gonna that I'm gonna tell you, publicly available, but perhaps not as well known. And then we're gonna that's in a sense setting up for well, what do the critics say? Not surprisingly, if if you follow the creation evolution debate, some of them tend to just ignore what's going on actually in the book and the in the in the science that leads up to it. But I'm gonna deal with some of the specific criticisms. And if you're a creationist, I'm here to say that they actually gave us some pretty significant gifts and aids to making the points that I've been trying to make for about 10 years. So I don't think you'll want to miss that. So today, focusing on the question of the history of South Asia, again, we're trying to keep these episodes fairly short, concise. I can't tell you everything that's in the chapter on South Asia or would be here for a long time. I want to revolve our discussion around the earliest stages of South Asian Indian history. And I'm, if you don't know the Indus Valley Civilization, if you pick up, let's say your, your average history book or archeology span book or anthropology book, and they talk about the beginning of humanity, of civilization, they'll talk about the cradles of civilization, of which there are several, the Minoans in Europe, the Egyptians in Africa, Sumerians in the Middle East, which we covered last time. And if, 
than today. It's the Indus Valley civilization here. I'll zoom in here in, in, in a moment and give you a better map of this. East Asia, you have the Yellow River Valley civilization. And in the Americas, you've got the Olmecs. So this is what we're talking about. The question we're going to try to ask and answer is, who gave rise to this? Now, I've I've been in discussions as a, as a result of some of the earlier episodes in this series and the research that's been going on. I've been speaking with several hundred South Asian individuals, some of it through translation, and have learned that this question is actually quite controversial in Indian circles because of some of the Hindu nationalists. And so if you're from the West and not aware of this, we're actually going to talk about a, a contentious topic. Now, I realize that many of our audience may be Westerners. And if you took history like I did last in high school and you took a world history course, you probably realize now, or you might realize now that much of what's called world history or these days, or at least was when I was growing up, tended to be a history of Western civilization. So I either learned very little or forgot the little that we covered about Eastern history, East Asia, South Asia, these sorts of things. So for the sake of our Western viewers, I want to just very briefly reorient you to what is South Asia? What are we talking about? And, and how does this connect to the Indus Valley? If you know anything about South Asia, you might say, well, okay, the Taj Mahal. Why am I not talking about the Taj Mahal? Taj Mahal was built by actually a group of invaders from Central Asia who ruled India. in the And, and this was built in the 1600s. It's a mausoleum to the wife of one of the rulers, the, the Mughal rulers, which I'll discuss here more in a moment. What we're talking about and the question we're focusing on is the complete opposite end of Indian history, the very beginnings of South Asian history, this Indus Valley civilization. This was the background photo I had for the title slide. It may not look like much, but it was a it was a massive civilization. This is from Mahanjadaro, just one of the many Indus Valley cities. So here's a, a more detailed map. This is a topographical map. And I'm going to show you here just how much area the Indus Valley civilization covered. I use this little circle. This is a more accurate description of what we know so far about where the Indus Valley people were. There's over a thousand settlements. I'm just going to give you some publicly available data for this. Over 300,000 square miles covered over a million people. And we just talked about the Middle East last time. You'll notice it's not that far to go from the Middle East through the Persian Gulf and over here to where they are. The Indus Valley civilization was international in scope, and you can find connections archaeologically between these Middle Eastern civilizations and the Indus Valley. It gets even more interesting when you consider the script of the Indus Valley people, their language. Like the ancient Sumerians, or excuse me, there is a parallel to the ancient Sumerians here, I'll tell you in a moment. There's a, there's a, there's a difference, though, from the Sumerians, I'm going to get at first. No one can read this. The language of the Indus Valley civilization is still undeciphered. And so the parallel then to Sumer is because it's unclass because it's undeciphered, you can't classify it. You basically have to consider it a language isolate at this point. And so it raises the question, if you're a creationist and a Christian, who did these people come from biblically? Which of the men in Genesis 10? Can we can we link them to any of the other peoples in India today? It it adds to the mystery of who these people were. Maybe if you're like me, you might be shocked to find out that there are still languages that were spoken on this planet that no one can still understand. I think if history is kind of cut and dry, this long list of facts that you learn and have to regurgitate, but there are still outstanding historical mysteries that no one has solved to this day, and this is one of them. So who built this civilization? What I'm going to do now is work our way backwards in time from the present. I said the focus of this series and of the book is this new, what we're calling the new Rosetta Stone of human history, a DNA-based generation-by-generation family tree for global humanity. And we want to use that tree to try to ask and answer the question, who do these people come from? Now, just a brief note on Indian geography. South Asian geography, because it plays a huge role in understanding how Indian history is played out. If you watch the episode on what happened to the ancient Romans, there is a strong geographic parallel between South Asia and Europe. So here's what I mean. 
you'll notice here in the southwest and southeast, there are large bodies of water, Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, that function effectively as barriers to invasion. They're not impenetrable, but it's a lot harder to invade a country if you have to pile your army in a boat, thinking about more ancient times, anything before the 20th century, float them over to where you're going to invade, unload them, and then try to try to conquer whoever it is that you're going after. For much of human history, a lot easier just to hop on your horse, go down, invade, and then ride back. Done. So this is a great way to keep India from being invaded. Lasted a long time. Yes, the British landed via sea, but this is late in history. This, this, is, this has done a great job keeping India isolated. In the northeast, you have the Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayan Mountains which has kept the Chinese civilizations and Indian civilizations apart for thousands of years. Again, you want to start conquering. How do you march your armies across the breathless heights up here to then get them back down to lower altitudes and conquer India or vice versa? The geographic vulnerability of South Asia is up here in the Northwest. Now you might say, well, it looks like mountains up here. Yes, but those mountains have passes. And time and time again throughout Indian history, that has been the way in which invaders have come through. And there's a parallel to Europe because that's European geography. In the north of Europe, of course, you've got the Arctic, which prevents from invasion. In the west, you've got the Atlantic Ocean. In the south, you've got the Mediterranean, which isn't that big. But if you're coming from Africa, yes, you can cross the Mediterranean. Or if you want to cross the Mediterranean, if you, if you come from Africa north, you've got to cross the Saharan Desert. So part of the geography of Africa actually protects Europe. My point in all that is in the east, Europe is vulnerable, and from the east is where you've had invasion after invasion, migration after migration, protected on the three sides, but not the fourth. Same thing holds true in here in India, and the Indus Valley civilization was exactly situated where the people have come through and invaded. So the Indus Valley civilization declined long ago in history, and the question is, what happened to the people? Are there any people in South Asia or in the globe today, somewhere, who can claim descent from the civilization. So again, I have to work through the lead up to this very quickly. I'm going to review South Asian history as it relates to genetics very fast, because I'm going to get to the answer or a candidate for this answer at the end. That's my primary goal. And just to say something perhaps unexpected, if you read the book, you'll know that at the outset, I think it's in chapter one, I give a disclaimer. I say we're at the early stages of this research. If you watched the last episode, you'll know I mentioned that 99% of today's men have yet to take a Y chromosome test. There's a ton of information still to be discovered. And I said in the opening part of the book, the conclusions in this book will likely change with time because that's what science does. It changes and adapts as more data comes in. I'm saying that because that's exactly what I'm going to do today. I'm going to disagree with some of the conclusions I put in my book because there's more data that has emerged. Science changes quickly. It's a slight change, but it has this, it has a fairly significant implication for Indian identity, for connections between modern Indians, modern South Asians, and the Indus Valley civilization, and of human worth. Yeah, that may not make sense. As I go on, it'll become clear. Okay, that's where I'm going. How are we going to get there? I'm going to start with the present and work my way backwards in time. Again, as a general rule of thumb, when you're looking at the genetic history of peoples, last conqueror tends to win, leaves the, tends to leave the biggest stamp. So long as they're there for a significant amount of time, you see this echo. Or if they've ruled for, even if they're the, not the, the most recent ruler, if they've ruled a particular era for a long period of time. Again, last episode, we talked about the ancient Persians, or excuse me, the Iranian peoples of which ancient Persia was a part, and how long Persians have ruled in the Middle East. And unsurprisingly, we, I, I argue in the book, there's a pretty good candidate for the Iranian peoples and the fact that we can find it despite so much tumult in the Middle East, I think is consistent with the fact that they've, they've been ruling for a long time. Now, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, these are independent countries today. Before independence, the most recent rulers were the British, part of the British Raj. Now, from my perspective, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, you see very little genetic echo of the British presence there. I'm suspicious that's the case because India has long been a 
significant concentration of people. Yes, the British were foreign rulers, but the rulers over a massive number of people. And so they're just, even if they were go sleeping around and, and leaving their DNA and these sorts of things, there are just so many people in South Asia, you just can't make that great of a dent if that's the goal. Ugly as that goal may be, my point is the British being the last rulers kind of violate this rule of thumb. They don't, ha they haven't left that much of a genetic echo that's detectable nationally. What has left a genetic echo are the rulers who immediately preceded the British Raj, the Mughal Empire. Now, if you look at Mughal and say that kind of looks like or sounds like Mongol, you'd be correct. It comes from, I think, the Persian word for the Mongols. And the Mughals were, by descent, not indigenous Indians, but they came from further north. They migrated down from Central Asia. They are Mongol in origin. Now, I've referenced this tree or this new Rosetta Stone, this DNA-based generation-by-generation family tree for global humanity. We're going to return to it now. Again, the naming scheme, just to, just to re refresh our memories, is that deep branches get arbitrary letters of the alphabet. I'm going to be focusing on this side here for a moment. So R has a deep branch back here that's separate from Q. And if R subdivides, then you assign a number, R1 versus R2. If it subdivides again, R1A versus R1B. It's this rule of using letter number, letter number combinations to know exactly where you are on the tree. I'm highlighting R1A because this seems to be the best candidate for the Mughal Empire for a number of reasons. Again, I'm, for sake of time, having to go through this very quickly. You can find the justifications in the book itself, the derivations. I'll just give you a preview of this. The distribution of R1A does extend into Central Asia, also Eastern Europe. And if you look at the structure of R1A, almost all of these branches have originated in the last few centuries. And this is where I wanna pause a moment and highlight again the apologetic or scientific significance of what we're doing with the Young Earth timescale. Again, the dates in the book are based on viewing the whole tree through the lens of 4,500 years. How do you know that's true? To give you some of the preview of where we're gonna go in future episodes dealing with this question of how do we know this is true? Does it line up with what we know about history? And here's a great example of this. The dates I've just assigned this, this part right here, the 1200s to 1600s AD, where you go from one branch to a whole bunch of branches, those will get bumped back thousands of years if you reevaluate this tree and reassign dates based on the mainstream time scale. Okay, so there's a difference. Why does this matter? Well, there's some information embedded in this branching structure and the dates I've assigned to it that has massive apologetic and scientific significance. So if you've been with us through the entire series, you're probably already familiar with this concept. I'm going to re review it very quickly for, for sake of refresher because it's such a fundamental concept and shows up again and again in this research and throughout the book. And that concept is that family trees record, yes, who you come from, also, when you came from this person, just the names that we use, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, there's an inherent component of time. Family trees also inherently record changes in population size. Use a biblical example. Jacob, one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, has 12 sons. So if you draw the male family tree, one branch from Jacob down to 12 branches to his sons, you take away the names, the number of branches on the family tree records these basic facts about a massive explosion in this family and in the, in the male population size. It's a kindergarten point in a sense, but once you apply it around the globe, oh wow, some really fascinating information emerges. One branch to an explosion of branches. That fits the known population of the globe at this point in history. What I mean is from the fields of history, historical records, and from the discipline of archeology, span we already knew that the, the shape of human population growth has this hockey stick shape. I'll give you a graph here in a moment. The dates I've assigned here based on the overall Young Earth framework is exactly in line with it. So just to show you again, this is, yes, a lineage that's found in South Asia, but also in Central Asia, also in Europe. We know from archaeology and from history, the population growth, the shape of that in Europe. I just said in the 1200s to 1600s on this tree, there was a sudden increase in human population growth. That's exactly when this spike in European population growth begins. Same basic shape for South Asia, sort of this hockey stick. Gradual growth, and then about the 1500s, it starts climbing. The rate of increase changes right in line with what uh, the, the Y chromosome tree shows. 
So there's real history that's revealed here. Now, given what I've just said, and I, I briefly went over this map, you might say, whoa, 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 whoa. You're saying that there are Europeans and South Asians who share a common ancestor just a few centuries ago. How do you explain that? I mentioned R1A is my best candidate for being the Mughal lineage, Mughals being Mongols. You think about the history of the Mongol Empire, the Mongol peoples, Genghis Khan and his affiliates conquer at that time the world's and, and, and form the world's greatest contiguous land-based empire from the Pacific all the way into Eastern Europe that breaks up among his various descendants and, and, and others thereafter. One of the kingdoms that hangs on for several centuries. So you can see here the date for the Mongol Empire, 1260 AD. This European component, because this is in what's now modern Russia and Eastern Europe, the Golden Horde here in green, hangs on until about the 1500s. And what spells their permanent demise is the rise of the Russians. So in 1533, the Russian Empire was just this. And in about a century and a half, Russia had conquered all the way to the Pacific. That's I'm, I'm breezing through Russian history real fast. My point is in the 1500s is when there's a key transition between Mongol rule and Russian rule. The beginning of the Mughal Empire is in 1526, and they're Mongols. So in Europe and down to India, there's a huge change that's occurring, which I think is consistent with Europeans and South Asians having a common ancestor. If nothing else, you have to realize, given the, the history of human population growth, there's a lot of people who have to have a common ancestor mathematically just a few centuries ago because of how human population sizes have changed. Of course, the bigger question is why these people, South Asians and Europeans, and I think we've got a lot of political tumult that explains this. I'm going to have to zip through the last few segments here real fast. Hopefully that gives you a flavor for how the book goes about associating historical events and explaining these various branches. My point is R1A, which I think is about, um, yeah, about 25% of South Asian men today. And I, sh I should mention here, the size of these circles represents the sort of abundance of this branch. So roughly 25% of Indian men belong to this. You can see, I think it's in, in Poland, maybe 60% of the men are R1A and there's the explanation for what this map represents. Okay, very quickly, for sake of time, other branches in India to this day and why they do not look like they belong to the Indus Valley civilization. We're gonna, what I'm going to show you is about the majority of Indian men today belong to lineages that came into India from the outside. In the 1200s AD, there was an empire called the Empire of Gur. The Gurids were not Turkic, but they had Turkic peoples in their armies. And in, in the book, and it was something I alluded to in the last episode, J2 seems to be associated with Turkic migrations in the recent history. It's in India. And if you look at the branching points, it comes into India. It appears around the time of these the, the Gurid Empire. So I've just told you this, haven't justified it because of time. The Kushans are a empire around the time of Christ, the centuries around the time of Christ. Actually, let me back up a second and say, Again, the size of the circles represents the relative abundance. About 5 to 10% of Indian men belong to J2. The Kushans, again, we're going backwards in time, uh, are around the time of Christ. Another foreign invader from Central Asia. About 10 to 20% of Indian men belong to the lineage that I think is associated with this. R2. I'm going through this quickly again. I apologize, for, but it's for sake of time. And then the last one I want to mention is this haplogroup L, which in chapter 13 of the book I show is Abrahamic in origin which again is not Indian in origin, it comes in from the outside, may have had something to do with the, the migrations of the Muslims. There were a number of Jewish people down here at the time the Arab Muslims went conquering. Of course, they came over the borders of India. And if you get L lineages that way, subsequent South Asian and Indian history can, can distribute it through the rest. Altogether, about 60% of Indian males belong to branches that do not look like they arose in, the, in India. 60% of Indian males belong to branches that look like they came into India from the outside, which would basically disqualify them from being candidates for the Indus Valley civilization. In the book, 
I point towards a branch, haplogroup H. Haplogroup is just the technical term for branch in this case, effectively. You can see from this map, haplogroup H is almost exclusively South Asian. If nothing else, the biggest circles are in South Asia. I think it's uh, about 35% of Bengalis in Bangladesh belong to haplogroup H. It has very deep origins. You can look at the, and I think I've got a diagram here in a moment. It basically goes back to the earliest times of human history, the origin of haplogroup H. And one of the things I also point out, I don't have time to fully justify this, but India also harbors a language family that's basically found in South Asia and nowhere else. Northern India, I think I've talked about this earlier, belongs to a to a to a subsection of the Indo-European language family. Sanskrit is an Indo-European language member. It's related to English. I had a hard time believing this until I looked at some of the early English Sanskrit comparisons. I thought, yep, there, there's a, there's similarities there. Hard to explain that away. There's that linguistic connection. Indo-Europeans, again, just to refresh our memories, are thought to have originated up here early in history, deep in history, and then gone their separate ways, including down into India. In the book, I show a diagram of my best candidate for the Indo-European lineages. Uh, one thing I want to point out here, though, that is a reason for me changing my thinking. So, excuse me, I haven't even given you the conclusion to my thinking. So let me give you the conclusion real fast. Going back to this branch H, here's what I say in the book, and here's where my thinking is changing. In the book, I say, I think haplogroup H is a good candidate for giving rise to an indigenous Indian group. For example, perhaps the earliest Dravidian language speakers, not the Indo-European speakers, I say, I say and, and I think mainstream science would say they came later. And it also makes H a candidate for the Indus Valley civilization. I'm now thinking differently. And here's part of the reason why. One of the diagrams I give in the book that I say, hey, look, uh, haplogroups I and J look like they're Indo-European in origin. They started up here and one group migrated into Europe. I, J migrated down here to the Middle East. If you look at this diagram, you'll notice that there's no circles in India. Yes, you can find J2 in India, but if you look at when J2 enters India, it's fairly late. No timing that it would be even remotely connected to the origin of the Indus Valley civilization. The point I'm driving at here is my identification of IJ with Indo-European seems to have a missing piece. If IJ is European, why isn't there some aspect of I and J in India at some of the earliest times? And I should clarify, mainstream history says the, in, the, the Indo-Europeans or the Indo-Aryans, the Indic, the Indo part of the Indo-European language family was in India coming from the outside, from up here, but from some very early stages, pre-1000 BC, likely. Yet in the book, I describe a branch of the tree, I and J, that I'm calling Indo-European, and the history that flows from it seems to cover just this part of the globe. Now, if you're saying, well, why not out here? Again, this orange, Russian's expansion, Russia's expansion, Russian is an Indo-European language, is late in history. My point is I cover the basically the European part of this. I can explain the European part of it. I can explain the Indo-Iranian part of it. But there's still this missing piece of how do you explain the early India Indo-European speakers. My, my book doesn't quite address this. There are clues, though, I think, that I've gone and revisited in the book itself that suggest an explanation. What I'm going to get towards is I now think H is actually Indo-European as well. I don't have enough data yet to publish this, but this is where I'm going. So in the book, there is a tiny circle out here in the Balkans. I, at the time, thought that's probably just part of the Indian diaspora. I mean, for for example, the Thousand Genomes Project samples Indians by going to people of Gujarati descent in Houston, Texas. The Indian Telugus were sampled from residents of the UK. The, I think also the Sri Lankan Tamils were residents of the uh, UK as well. So Big surprise, there's just a small population of, of Balkan individuals who belong to H, probably just part of the Indian diaspora. Same thing here. Here's finally what I wanted to show you. You can see the deep origins of H back to the time of early post Babel. Uh, in this diagram, in this particular study of 600 men, which is, that's what I've drawn this from, 
most of the men listed, Barusho, Balochi, Kalash, these are Pakistanis, South Indians, excuse me, South Asians. But there is this French individual, which again, I was aware of it. I thought, ah, probably just part of the Indian diaspora. Perhaps there's some Indians in France and that's how H got there. The origin or the separation of that French lineage from the South Asian one is deep in history, 2300 BC to 1900 BC, which intriguingly is very close in time to what I'm saying is that separation between I and J, when the European part of Indo-European went to Europe and the Asian part, J, separated from that. So there's, there's so here's what I'm laying out. It appears, and some of the people who've contacted me, there's, there's additional evidence here. What appears to be emerging is there is a rare European presence of haplogroup H, number one. Number two, the origin of that European H appears to be ancient. I don't think I can explain it away as part of the recent Indian diaspora in the globe. Thirdly, what ancient event could explain a connection between Europe and South Asia? And the first thing that comes to mind is the Indo-European language family. Fourthly, the timing of this separation, 2300s to 1900s, is eerily close to what I'm calling, to what I've dated the separation between I and J. And of course, like I said, there's, there's already this evidence that there is this low level in Europe. Long story short, here's what I think is the explanation now. I talk about in the book where you can see the echo of Genesis 10. I'm, I'm breezing through this very quickly. I'm, I'm highlighting this aspect because, again, I'm calling I, J, Indo-European. Biblically, the Indo-Europeans, I think, would have come from Japheth. In this diagram, H comes from Ham, not from Japheth. So what's going on? I think, long story short, and again, there'll be there'll be more, I think, coming out in the future as more data is gathered. What I what I originally said was that I and J was Indo-European, and then they separated in the distant past when they're separate ways. I was missing the Indian component. What I think actually happened first was I and J were the original Indo-Europeans, and deep in history, perhaps around the time of Abraham, I and J either conquered H or H was assimilated into I and J. And then together, this genetically mixed group that I'm calling into European went its separate ways with I ending up in Europe, J ending up in Asia, most of H ending up in India and a very rare subset of H ending up in Europe. The reason I've told you all this, that I've rethought H is because if H is indeed into European, that it was in the Ural Mountain, north of the Black Sea area in ancient times, and not in India, that means H is probably not the explanation for the origin of the peoples of the Indus Valley civilization. It makes this question open again. So who gave rise to the Indus Valley people? Just to summarize, what I say in the book, I think is probably not the explanation. In the book, I say haplogroup H is. Now I'm thinking haplogroup H is probably part of the Indo-Europeans, which raises the question, well, then who is? Who gave rise to these early people? One of the best candidates moving forward is what I'm calling haplogroup F. You may say, what in the world are you calling haplogroup F? Is Indus Valley civilization, if you look at the haplogroup F map in the book, India, South Asia is blank. I've got no circles there for F. Why? Because I'm basically looking at broad swaths of nations. I tried to avoid looking at minority groups that, by definition, that are just a small fraction of the total population because I'm looking for big picture patterns. Well, the big picture patterns haven't answered the question of who the Indus Valley people came from and what happened to them. Let's dig into some of the minority groups of India. I'm changing this diagram here. I want you to focus on what happens to this small circle. Actually, I don't know if you can, PowerPoint is slow here because uh, it's a large file size that I'm trying to go to next. What I'm gonna show you is that in this next map, the forest peoples of South India have high levels of haplogroup F. The forest peoples, the downtrodden peoples of India have high levels of a group that has an ancient origin. PowerPoint is shutting down on me, so let me just see if I can advance the slide. I'm not surprised by this because um, I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen. Oh, now it advanced, because I stopped sharing the screen. 
I'll share the screen again. And here we go. This is the map I wanted to show you. I'm not going to go back and forth between it. Uh, there we go, because it's probably going to slam PowerPoint, can't handle it. But what I want you to see here is the, I, I've changed the scale of the map. So what used to be fairly significant circles, like here in, in Vietnam, if you look in the, in, the, in the map in the book, it's this decent, I mean, it's a small circle, but it's a decent sized circle. It's basically the size of this red laser pointer I'm using. Uh, I've made it tiny. It still represents the same thing. About 2% of the Vietnamese belong to F so that you can see 60, maybe 80% of these forest peoples in India belong to this F. Long story short, the peoples of India well, I think the forest peoples are viewed as low caste, may actually be the descendants of the Indus Valley people. So those who in Indian society today are looked down upon, they have in their DNA an ancient connection to one of the most storied civilizations in Indian history. So what can that do for human dignity? That's to me one of the most satisfying aspects of this project as we uncover human history and the connections among various people groups is to give people back their history and when their value has been taken away by their neighbors to restore it. So if you're part of a South Indian group or you're interested in participating in this project going forward, and I've already been in discussion, like I said, with a number of South Indians, what we're gonna try to do is find some South Indian males who belong to group F, nobody knows where exactly on the tree these individuals branch off. My guess is it's a very ancient origin. And if it is, we're beginning to build a case that these might be the descendants of the Indus Valley civilization. So if you want to participate, go to answersandgenesis.org slash go slash trace. You can click on that link or scroll down and enter your name and email. It goes directly to my inbox. Would be Would love to chat with you further. So just to summarize, I've gone through Indian history very quickly. India is like Europe in that it has a, has, is protected geographically on three sides. The fourth is a vulnerability. Countless peoples have come in through that Northwestern vulnerability and left their genetic echoes among the modern South Asian populations. In the book, despite all that, I say, hey, there's this lineage chapel group H that looks like it perhaps is a candidate for the Indus Valley people and the Dravidians. I'm now leaning towards H is actually into European part of an ancient conquest or and or assimilation. And instead, it may be some of these minority groups in India who hold the key to unlocking the earliest clues to Indian Indus Valley history. Preview again of the South Asian chapter of this book. We'll talk more about this other book I wrote four and a half years ago and its connection to Traced in future episodes. The simple version of that is replacing Darwin Made Simple. You again can find me directly to my email via that portal that I listed, primarily again for genetic research and such or genetic questions, but you can find me on social media as well, multiple platforms. I appreciate all y'all's interest in this. We've got more episodes coming in the future. We've got more uh, videos, more regions of the globe to cover, East Asia, uh, the Pacific we're gonna cover. And then of course, we're gonna eventually go to a little mini series that steps back and says, how do we know all these conclusions are true? and then deal with some of the critics. So thanks so much for participating. I'll turn it back over to Brian. All right, guys, I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I know it's a lot to take in, but there's so much good information. And bear in mind what Dr. Jensen is doing, really weaving together to the best of our ability, uh, history, genetics, the Bible, there's a lot of strands being brought into play here, but it is so well done. And then the big picture is being painted is so beautiful. And I love the point uh, that you brought out, uh, Nathaniel, earlier that we're really trying to restore the, the, the dignity of peoples as we recognize uh, their common humanity. And you see traces of that history and where they come from, dignity there, but also the ultimate dignity that we all go back to Adam and Eve, that we're made in God's image because of that fact. And so no matter what your skin shade might be today, what your language might be today, we all go back to that first man and first woman. Therefore, we're all made in God's image. And therefore, we have indelible inherent value, which is such a beautiful picture that's painted in such a vivid way in this book, Traced, in the research that you have done. Uh, it really is phenomenal. And we're so excited that it's part of the ministry of what God is doing here at Answers in Genesis. And again, guys, as I mentioned last episode, we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more we're going to dive into on future episodes. So I hope you guys enjoy that one. And hang on tight. There's more to come. We will see you guys next time.